I was talking about this, the nature of ikhlas, and I mentioned this concept of the eye on Allah, and the Prophet Sallallahu and his personal ananiyat, or his ayness, and then the ayness of each person, ananayim, ana Muhammad, ana Zayd, ana Aisha, how you use this word, ana, according to Imam Rabbani, we, have, we indicate our individuality by this word ana, and we're unique as creatures that do that. You know, you're not going to find, you know, a brown pelican identifying itself individually that way. This is a unique thing. And it's something which is given to us by Allah. Allah is Allah calls himself Anna, and because Allah addresses himself as I, we are capable of addressing ourselves as I. And a lot of us don't think this way. This is the reality. So I wanted to, before I wrote the, on the board there, where I want to, I'm going to do like a little writing, I'm going to try and give you something you can visualize, you can understand it. I mentioned that Sir Hindi had talked about the Sharia having three parts. And I want to just read some of this letter, because it's one of the most important letters, though it's very simple. And he discusses in it the idea of Sharia, of knowledge, and he talks about the purpose of Tasawwuf or Sikhism. This is letter number 36 in volume 1. It's a maktub of status of Tarakum, Tiyan, Anna Sharia. Muzikafala to Nijami, Sa'adat, Dunyumiyo, Dunyumiyo, Diniyo, Dunyumiyo, Tariqa, Wa Hakika, Khalamantana, the Sharia, Wa Maynas, Wa Dalaka, the Haj Muhammad Al Ghori. He wrote this letter to a man named Muhammad Al Ghori, who had made Hajj. And he talks about that the Sharia is a guarantor for all good things for this life and the life to come. The Sharia. The Sharia being what? The Sharia is, if you keep that in mind, the, the operationalized prophetic reality that you can engage with. It's your relationship with Muhammad. So that guarantees you paradise. It guarantees you a good life. The more you are mirroring Muhammad, the more you are paradisio in nature. And of course, the people in paradise, for example, in paradise, there's no logo, for example. In paradise, there's no frivolous conversation. So, if you're a person of the of, who's mirroring paradise realities, you don't have khiba in your life, you don't have namima in your life, you don't have backbiting, uh, tail-bearing, lying, because that's logo. And since the people of Jannah speak, and they have, they have conversations, they don't have logo. So the more you're paradisio, the more you're like Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi He wasn't a liar. He did not backbite. Even when he joked, there was truth in it. So he's paradisio already. Keep this, you have to keep this in mind. And if you just take anything from me in these talks, whether it's a theory or whatever I'm saying, or it's a big word, I don't really care. It's this reality that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The more you mirror him, you're more paradisio. The more you're the more you're going home. And the more intense you are in that, and the it will be your intensity in the life to come. Because the closest to him in, in the afterlife are those who are most like him in character traits. So the more your character traits are, are, are madmuma, are dispraiseworthy, and not mahmuda, or muhammadi, praiseworthy, the farther you'll be from in Jannah. Allah will give you Jannah. Even as Imam Marani says, I wish I didn't read more in that letter. He said, even if your nafs is a mara, Allah will still gives you jannah. Why? Because he's generous. He's a Rahman. Even though you rebel against him, he will still give you because you have tasnikal kal. You affirm in your heart his, his tawheed. You say it on your tongue, and that will get you jannah. But it will not get you the highest place in jannah. You can have what you want. You can have this much space in jannah right here. If you've got this much space in jannah, you're not going to complain. You'll be happy. But you'll still be looking up at those things that look like stars. You won't regret it. Because you won't know what's there, perhaps. But you can be there if you want. And how you're there is the more you're like Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the more you are like him. And that's what your life is about. You can do whatever you want. I don't care whether you're a doctor, an engineer, a garbage man. A garbage man. I don't care if you're a gardener. I don't care what you do. You can be Muhammad in any state. And you can be Jahil and Ghafil in any state. So, keep these in mind, so he says, How can Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be hakikat al-shariyat wa sahibiha as-salatu wa sallam wa tahiyyat 
May Allah subhanahu allow us and for you to be realized to the reality of the Mustafawi sacred law upon its progenitor, its asal, its sahib, its possessor. Salat wa salam wa tahiyyat, it is Muhammad wa salam. May Allah have mercy on anyone who says ameen to this dua. Ameen. Dear Lam, you should know that it is Muhammad Allah Gauri. And in the Sharia, Salat al Ajza, Al Ilm, Awal Amal, Ikhlas. You should know that the Sharia has three parts knowledge, practice, and Ikhlas. So he says here, pay attention, the Sharia has three parts, knowledge, practice, and ikhlas. And whenever these three are realized, then the Sharia is realized. And when the Sharia is realized, Allah's Ridha is realized. Allah's acceptance, His Ridha is realized. And Allah's Ridha is the greatest good, Sa'ada, you can never get, is Allah's acceptance. Nothing else will count. Ridha Allah is the greatest thing to have. And He says, Ridha from Allah is the greatest of things. He says, <clears throat> the, the Sharia is a guarantor of all good of this life and life to come, and there's nothing left to be sought beyond that you need beyond the Sharia. It's sufficient for you. But don't understand Sharia as simply a list of do's and don'ts. Don't see it like that. This Mohammedan embodiment, the clothing of, you know, the basil taqwa, for example. The basil taqwa. The basil is something you carry, right? It's something, but what is taqwa? Well, taqwa, and that's what I'm going to get to really quickly here. So from now, I'm going to hold that thought. Walk with my hand over here. So we mentioned, he mentioned, Allah, as an Allah, right? I am Allah. They have Allah's Ines. And this word, this word Allah, you find is as the Asma and the Sifat and the That of Allah. Of course, I, it's Asma, Un, Sifat, and That. These three aspects are contained in this name. This name, this word, is not only a, an Ism, like an, uh, it's also a, a proper name. It's not, so it's a proper name, like I am Naim. So when you say Naim, you mean all the things that make Naim mean. My thoughts, my ideas, my clothing, my attitudes, my peculiarness about me, how I speak, how I stand. That's Naim. All those things are Naim. Right? And that's who I am. So there's this word, the Ism, and there's the Musamma, there's the name, there's the word Naim, and there's the named Naim. And they're the same. Allah has a name, Allah. But this name indicates all these three aspects, asma, sifat, and that. The that as Allah is in His goodity, in His unique individuality, of what God is that makes Him unique. That's His that. And that we don't really reflect upon. But asma and sifat, you can know. Allah gives you indicators of what He is. But no matter how you con conceive of these names, He's wara awara, He's beyond and beyond. If you think you've contained Him, which you can't, He's beyond that. Yet you have names. And there are names you don't even know. Names are hidden with Allah. According to the Prophet, the dua he made, they asked by the names that you manifest and the names you kept hidden. So things that are not even known of Allah's nature, that we can know by names indicating something of divine nature. Then there's Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Right? Alayhi Salaam. And he mentioned himself, he is Adam, most knowing. And he's Atka. He's Atka. He's most fearing. Minkum. Ana. He said. So he has an Ana. 
That is Anna Muhammad. It's Muhammad and Inas. And his Muhammad and Inas has two parts to it in the hadith. Knowledge and taqwa. And the Sahindi says what? The Sharia has, the Sharia has three parts. What? It has ilm. I should write it like this. The Sharia. The Sharia. Right? The Sharia has two two parts. Ilam and Amal. Oh, yeah. Ilam and Amal. I got it right. Ilam and Amal. There's a knowing of God and there's a relational aspect of attitude and expressiveness towards God. That's taqwa. Because what's taqwa? Taqwa basically means to avoid the things that are forbidden, to fulfill the commands that are given. It's the practice. That's what taqwa means. It's that relational aspect. It's, a taqwa is not an attitude of feeling. It's an expressive state of taqwa. That's what taqwa is. So in this hadith itself, it indicates the two things of sharia, except the third ikhlas. But he already had ikhlas. Because he's also... Right? Abdul Shakuran. Right? He is the grateful servant. Shakuran. Yeah. There it goes. Shakuran. He's the perfect servant. His abdiyat, his state of abdiyat, his ubudiyat, his state of worshipfulness is perfect. Because his knowledge is perfect of God and his practice is perfect with God. It's all combined together. And this is who Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi is. You have, but here you are. Ana Zaid. I'm Zaid. But this Zaid, you know, is like his friend Amr. Yeah. Mm, you know, sometimes he's with some. So his Inus, his Inus is a bit problematic. His Inus is perfect as a creature, and his Inus is unique. His Inus is perfectly in a state of rila. This one, this eye, is perfectly in a state of rila with that eye. And the more you are with this eye, will you then traverse to that. It's a very simple idea. So Hindi says this is what the self is about. How do you get this to come to this to get to there? That's all the self is about. Sufism is just about this one thing. Taking your eyeness, from being Zayd, the rebellious guy, the Asi, the Zalim, Zalim the Nafsihi, Zalim the, the Akhirin, he's, not, he's, he's a Zalim to himself, he's a Zalim to his own soul, he's a Zalim to his wife, he's a Zalim to his children, he's Asi, he's rebellious, he's a Munkir, he's a denier, he's sometimes he's a hidden Munafik, he's a called to them, he's all kinds of issues he's struggling with. He's not Mohammedan yet. Why? It's simple, he doesn't have this yet. He's not, he's not rotten the law as his Lord. Simple. But Sir Hindi said, but you said you believed in God. Yeah, I'm unto Bilay. I believe in Allah. Really? But your deeds don't display it. Well, you know. Mm. That's our problem. But the thing is, this is not impossible to overcome. This is not impossible to overcome. It's just that we've, re we've met various people who've overcome it that we think it's impossible. It doesn't exist. That's our problem. You know? We're the saints anymore. Like Hassan Basri said, you know, Islam is in the in the books and the Muslims are in the graves. And it was Hassan Basri saying that a long, long time ago. So imagine what Hassan Basri, you know, it's my Sheikh said, I mean, once he said, you know that, you know, if um, you know if a companion came back today, he would we would think he was human. And, he wouldn't think we were Muslims, probably. Was it Abu Darda, the companion, who was complaining? He came back to his wife angry, saying, the only, all, well, the only thing that the Muhammad Islam brought us that was left with us anymore is the prayer and the jama'ah. He talked about companion and tabai. Now, he was a rather strict companion, and he was very fastidious about stuff. But he's complaining to his wife about this, that all I can find are the, are the athar, the effects of Muhammad Islam, is the congregational prayer. That's it. And this is a time of taboon. And you can disagree with him, right? You don't have to agree with him, 
But you should be mindful of what he's trying to say. So it's not like it's a lost cause. It's not. It's not. But it may require a bit of reconsidering what we're doing. So I didn't know this, though. You know, this is what my shake had in store for me. When I went to Turkey, it was just to go get a shake and, you know, spend some time with him, do some liquor, and become a better person. I didn't know anything that was going on, so I didn't know any of this stuff. It wasn't like I got a book, here's the plan, and you're going to take this plan, and you're going to stick with it, and you're going to get something out of it. No way. Even the way I'm telling you now was not taught to me. I figured this out by putting it together. It took time. It actually took a good over a decade to figure stuff out. But then when I figured it out through reading and meditation, literally, because I don't do these things without meditation. I was taught meditation, and I use meditation. No, like, you know, a, a Nakshibani type of meditation in which these things I know. No more than someone like Shahoyu Laws when else can have experience. You know, I, don't, I have now come to this full conclusion, this is my personal view on things, is that we're all heirs of these knowledge. We're not like, it's like a special thing. We're all heirs of this type of knowledge. It's just that we don't air ourselves out now. We're all stuffy. And we don't. It's not like this is a mystery kind of thing. It's all there for you. It's just that most of us choose not to pick it. It's like Allah, Allah is with you wherever you are, but you don't want to be with Him wherever you are. You see? He's already with you wherever you are. So what is Ma'iya? What is divine witness? Well, it's something, obviously. He's with you wherever you are. It's not like He's your buddy next to you, but if you're not with Him wherever you are, I am as my servant thinks I am. So if you don't want to be with Him, He won't be with you. You give Him this much, He'll give you this much. You put out your hand, He'll put out more. But most of us don't even give a hand. But you're still saved. That's the good thing. He's so generous, he'll put you in Jannah. Well, that's a great gift. He's so, he's Rahman. You know, his mercy outstrips his anger. That's why Jinli says that mercy is asli, while ghadab is far'i. That the asl is mercy, and anger comes later. But most, this is what, but you don't hear this in our mosques, by the way. I tell you in America. It's not being taught in our mosques. Honestly. If we were really taught these things if a slab, then we might, we'd all be hanging out more at the masjid. Seriously. But these are things that were taught in mosques once around the Muslim world. But now it's like, yeah, ta'abidah, haram, yeah, tasawwuf, yasnaq for Allah. You know, it's like these people are freaks and weirdos. Well, I don't know. I don't feel like a freak out of my clothes. I don't know. <laughs> my wife, my wife's a good seamstress. She makes all my clothes for me. My mother-in-law knitted this for me. Ooh, my mother-in-law knitted that for me. And my wife made this, and she made this for me. This is hand spun from India. I'm really picky about my clothes. He knows it. My students know I'm very picky. But that's all I've got. And they were like, why did you bring to... It was like, it was asking... Where is it? it was you, he was asking... What is your name? Where's his luggage? That's my luggage right there. <laughs> That's what I brought. I got a t-shirt and a pair of pajamas. In case I end in their house and I want to run around my long john. I have my long johns on here, you know? <laughs> That's all I have. My students know I have one pair of clothes, except and that's it. Because the prophet had basically all the time one pair of clothes. I choose that in my lifestyle. I'm not a saint, but I can do it in an age of commercialism and waste. <laughs> I even felt guilty taking a plane to get here. And they put me in business class and I had this nice food and I felt guilty about the people in the back. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I'm, but it's just that, you know, make choices. I guess the when cockroach was in a house in Turkey got me broken, broke me down a little bit. <laughs> yeah. It did. It broke me down. My wife and I, when we first got married, I had no money. My shake wouldn't let me work. He said, you will trust in Allah. It wouldn't be work. And my wife's father, the gold dealer, and he had a nice business in Turkey. But you know, we would literally cow money. And we had one, our first apartment was like this little, with one room, all was cold, and one room we had a coal burning, a coal stove, and that was it. In wintertime, it was really cold, and all the rooms you go to the rooms and you could see your breath, you know? And we had one room where I had to put coal in it all night long to keep it hot in that one room because Ahmed was born, Ahmed was first born. And my wife never complained. She never complained. 
Alhamdulillah. Oh, she can complain now. You know. <laughs> <laughs> He's been married for me for 21 years. You know, it's not to quite complain. This guy's just weird. My wife wants our sheikh, and maybe I shouldn't be with Naeem. Because he wants to fly, and I want to be on the... I just have with five prayers a day. But as I tell my wife, my wife, is her feet are on the ground, and she holds a rope to my kite of myself. Because I'm ready to flow off. She's sitting there talking to her mom about some chorba, some soup, and I'm reading Ibn Arabi or something, or, or Heidegger. And I can't really talk to her about it, because she doesn't understand who this, and I can't talk to her about it. This is how it is. This is a weird relationship. So he says, the Sharia is a guarantee for all goodness. Muhammad is a guarantor of all goodness. He's your kafil, guarantor. Because he's been to paradise. And he knows how to get you back there. But you can't resist him. Man asani fakat aba. He who rebels against me has refused paradise. Simple. You choose not to enter. So, then he says, what tarika, a tarikat, a spiritual path, what hakika, the experiences that have happened to you on the spiritual path. And they're real experiences, by the way. This is not make-believe stuff. I'm always getting emails from my students about things that they're experiencing. Their states. What does it mean? Students who were very incredulous about these things, they oh, well, maybe it's true. And now, when it happens to them, they go, oh, what's happening? Of course, if you don't really care much about experiences, it's just whatever. If you're, a new, if you're a student, it's like, ooh, then you always be careful not to deceive yourself, which we'll get to that point here. And the Tani, him tells that be him a Sufiya, Khadim Tani Sharia. Tariqa, a formal spiritual path, like a madha of spirituality, like this Hanafi fiqh, its own usul, and its outcomes, its derivatives from usul, from, you take the usul, you take the methodology, which is the madha, a methodology, a madha, a way of walking, you apply that to Quran and Sunnah, and then you apply the Quran and Sunnah through the formula of the Matha, you end up with fatawa, outcomes. And that's fit. And that also will apply over to issues of creed. But it also is it with Ihsan, because Ihsan is as if you could see him, and that's a state you're in. It's a spiritual state. Or it's knowing he sees you, so it's an intense awareness of Allah. Well, that also can be processed through methodology to be operationalized, to be cultivated. That's called tariqa, just as the matha for fiqh. And there are schools within issues of kalam, with asharag or madridag or whatever. There's also in this practices that are formalized practices that cultivate states of deep awareness. That's tariqa. And then what you experience is your hakika, what you experience. And he says these two things are what, are, are what distinguish Sufis. Sufis are known about tariqa and hakika. That's, uh, that's what your first name is. He says these two are the servants, the khadimatani, the shaykh. They serve the sharia. They serve the sharia. Ilam amal ikhlas. Why? Fi takmil juz iha athanin. They help to bring to completion the third part of the sharia. Ilam amal ikhlas. To help to operationalize ikhlas. How can you have ikhlas? That's what tariqah is for. Allah huwa ikhlas. Fa maqsoon min ta'seel kullun. Kullun min hama takmeel sharia. The purpose of going on a spiritual path and having these experiences is to, is to fulfill and complete your sharia. To make your sharia complete. That's it. Nothing more. Let Amun Akha, there's no other issue here, there's no other affair beyond this, except fulfilling the Sharia. What are Sharia? There's nothing beyond the Sharia you need. The Sharia is sufficient, it's your, it's your kafil, it's your character, and Tariqa, and, and Hakikat, these experiences and practices are there to fulfill, bring in Ikhlas, so your Sharia is now perfected. It's all brought together. Now your practice and your knowledge will now be in agreement with each other. Your knowing and your doing are now in agreement because you are now opened up to God experientially when you weren't before. You knew Him before. You knew Him intellectually. You could, def you could argue a case for Tawheed with a non-believer. 
You can defend Allah's transcendence with the mujassim, the metamorphosis, for example. We argue those cases from textual evidences, but you haven't yet experienced that. This is the point. So one way I define tariqah, the tariqah, is a means to operationalize experiential tawheed. Tawheed to afal, divine action, asma and sifat, and in that. This is important. Because Sir Hindi's spiritual path is starting to work with experiences of divine activity, asma and sifat, and that. It's a process through the, the spectrum of tawheed and all levels of tawheed. From the outward, ufuki to unfusi, inward. That which is outward through divine activity, and that which is essentially God in his ananiyat, in his ayness, in his individuality, and bringing your ayness to a mere relationship of individuality with Allah. So you reflect the Muhammadan ananiyat in yourself, ayness, in some manner. That's Allah. He's looking at me strange. <laughs> then you know when your husband hangs out. <laughs> he scratches his head and wears his Batman pajamas <laughs> to our gatherings. What ahwal, what mawajid, what ulum, what ma'arif, alati tu salu ashari, the sufiya fi athna tariqa, laysat mina maqasid, balhiya au hamun, wa khayalatun. Listen to this. He says, Ahwa, spiritual states. Mawaji, ecstatic experiences. Ulum, no types of knowing. Mar, gnosis. These things that people speak of. The spiritual states, the spiritual highs. You might see a video of an ecstatic Sufi going into a sometimes. Well, oh, what's that? He says, this is nothing. He says, all these things that occur to the Sufi in his in his spiritual journey, in the course of his spiritual journey, they are not the objective. But they are in there, but they are simply illusions and fantasies. They're illusion. They're, they're not real. By which the child of the spiritual path is nurtured. To Rabba. He's nurtured in them. And one letter to Allah says, if you knew what Tawheed really was, you would despair. How can you get to a God that every time you take a step towards the God, He's beyond you? And the more you know Him, He's beyond that. He's wara, wara, wara. No matter what you think you know, until St. Abba says what? He said, Allah, lack of, com com lack of comprehensive knowing of God is knowing God. When you have idrak of Allah, when you are in limit, you are incapable of, of defining Him or circumscribing Him in any way, then you truly understood God. That's why at the end of the path is hayran, is bewilderment. Because that's tawheed. You can't put God in a, in a Create a pocket in your right next to your heart. It doesn't work that way. Just because you memorize the Tawbah Lahid doesn't mean you know God. You memorize, you memorize some words, maybe descriptive of God, but that's not knowing God. It's, and knowing God is experiential, not just something discursive or something which you have rationalized in your mind and you defined in that way. It's much deeper than that. It's much deeper than that. How would someone describe you? How could you give the fullness of your own self to someone? How would you know that? You see me now. You see a person who, is, who has sort of pinkish colored skin and he's got his turban on and that's all you see of Naeem. You have no idea who Naeem is. The fullness of Naeem's Ananiyat, Ainas of Naeem, you'll never know. How could you truly know God then? And thus, he says, if, if the student of the spiritual path do this, he would give up. So what does God do? It's easy. Like this little point here, you know? He's in here playing this food. You know, I go, you know this, this food is so dry. That's why I here, have a little, but here's some, here's some kulab java. Take that for now. Oh, he says, well, nice kulab java. You don't eat that, you know? Because you give God, you're giving something sweet on the path, and a dream, an experience, and you're curious about it. And so you move forward with that. 
You may be, well, next time I do my dhikr, it'll happen again. He so you do more dhikr. The objective was dhikr. The carrot was the experience. Come on, come on. <laughs> do more dhikr. Do this dhikr until you're no longer there anymore. The ananiyat disappears. The inus is gone. And so he says, from there he says, he says, therefore you have to get beyond all these things. So you get to the station of Ridha, you get to Ridha. You move beyond all the experiences to, to absolute agreement with God. You agree now. Your nafs goes from a state of Amara to a state of Itmitnan. But that's not the end of the story. You see, it doesn't end there. It's not like when you get to the state of Itmitnan, you get angel wings and you get a halo and a heart and white clothes, and you're out in the world. Oh, I'm a nice person. I'm... No, because you're still flesh and bone. You're still a person of physicality. And you'll always have to deal with that. You'll still have animalistic qualities to you, Rikazali. You'll struggle with your beastly qualities. That's just physicality. And that's what the Sharia is not able to control. Before, you went and drank. You committed adultery. You were backbiting. <coughs> Your tongue was committing sins of the tongue. Your eye has a zina of the eye. The process every organ has zina. There's zina of the sexual organs, and a zina of the eyes, a zina of the tongue, a zina of the ear, a zina of the hand. That's, you know, backbiting, lying, looking at haram things, listening to haram things, touching haram things. This is all zina. But you'll be different now. Which I haven't gotten to yet. So he says. Because the station of Ridha is the end point of spiritual journey and divine attraction. It is divine contentment. Where God is accepting of you and you are accepting of God. You have a state of contentment with Him, you are agreeing with Him, and you're no longer in a state of rebelliousness. The only purpose to traverse the stations of spiritual of the spiritual path and the, the spiritual states is the acquisition of ikhlas. Which you need to get to the station of Ridha. You have to have ikhlas to get there. So he says, well, Qasir, ah, who's the Qasir? Who's the person in loss? It's the Qasir's person. He says, yeah, there are losers in this way. These are the people, the Sufis, who think that spiritual states and ecstatic experiences are the purpose of tasawwuf. And that they think that the things that they experience in mushahadat and, to, and, and to janiyat, the spiritual states that come upon them, those are objectives. He says, no. He says, he says um, these people, no doubt, they remain in a prison of self-delusion. And they are banned. They are barred from attaining to the perfections of the Sharia. Then he starts, he talks about the perfections of the Sharia. He's been talking about this idea of just taking your nafs from a state of Amara to a state of Itmitnan. But the reality is bringing you to a state of perfecting Sharia. What does that mean? Perfecting your ability to be operationalized in Muhammadan form. That's all it's about. But then he'll say later in another letter, which we read partly, what, one of the problems is, is that as you do this, as you do this, let's say you do that. Oh, you do all this thicker, and you, and you have these experiences, and, you, and, you, and, you, and, you, and your nafs goes from a state of amara, of rebelliousness, to it be none. Then you have one problem left, and that's your body. And that's why you want to perfect your sharia. 
Because perfecting a shodian means that you bring your body in balance. This is the religion of itadah. This is a balance, this is the religion of equitableness. Adana. Right? So there are limits, there are hadud. There are hadud. In the, you know, the sharia has hadud. It lays out limits. You don't transgress the limits. So you say in the so what you say most of most of the average Muslim, these are the limits of Sharia, but people are outside the limits. They're back and forth, back and forth. That means that they are not realizing a Mohammedan state of being. So what can you do? The Sharia is not a narrow thing, it's actually quite broad, but it has limits to it. So what you're able to do is you contract yourself through the nafs amara going to nafs al-mutma'inna. You bring yourself in these limits. So now you modulate within the limits. And you don't overstep them. Then now you are the balanced Muslim. But maybe for you, your limits are over, you're on this side. Maybe for someone else, they're over here. But you're still in the state of limits. That's what the purpose of this is all about. Okay? And how you do that is lots of victory. Because that's what transforms the heart. This is what happens. Now for saying Hindi, this path, when he, when he talks about ikhlas, he's not talking about the ikhlas, well, for example, okay, I'm going to stand up for Isha prayer, I'm behind the imam, I intend to offer Boraka behind the imam in a congregation prayer for Isha. You make your formal niya, right? You make a niya. You make a niya when you're making your wudu. If you're a shafi, the first time the water touches your face, you make the niya to rafa hada, remove its original impurity. If you're hanafi, the fact that you're actually making wudu means you've intended it. Da -da -da. So it's not too much of a, it's a, it's a no brainer for hanafis. If you're doing it, you probably intended it. You know? But for shafis, you have to actually intentionalize it. You intentionalize your first salam to leave the prayer, for example. You intentionalize your takbir. You say, Allah, Akbar, you're actually intending the prayer at that time doing the takbir. So they're very specific, for example, the Shafi's on this idea of niyam, for example. But that's just a shari issue. So Hindi who talks about niyam, in relation to ikhlas, he doesn't mean that. He means you're constantly in a state of niyam. It means you're in a state of awareness, hudur. So the only reason you, will, you do a niyam for the prayer is because the shari demands it. Not because you were forgetting God. That's the interesting thing. So most people just remember God formally because they just remember God formally because they, oh, yeah, I, I do this for the sake of God. You know, I give my zakat, I gave my zakat, I, and I, I forgot to mention God, and it's too late now. Once you give it, you can't take it back. It's gone. You can't, like, have a reverse intention for zakat. You have to intend it at that moment. But if you're constantly in a state of awareness of Allah, which is what you want to get to, you, you know what you're giving is a cat, you're aware of that, and when the Sharia says you must give it beforehand, you do. And then you walk on through it, it passes through. To him, ikhlas should be like this. It should be a constant state of awareness, hudur, not these sort of like gaps of conscious remembrance. And when we do it in a state of constant awareness, it's only because the Sharia demands us to do it. And we, sami'ana wa atana, and we've heard, and we obey, and we comply. That's how it should be. So, that's sort of what I want to talk about tonight. When I talk about that stuff. 